I'm Chris Harris. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you tonight. I typically teach um, at San Jose State on Tuesday nights, so this is a welcome change. I teach graduate students as well as direct the Esther B. Clark schools. And we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk just a little bit about that in just a second. So for the, anybody brand new here to CHC? Oh, okay, great, wow. Usually we have a lot of repeat people and they already know about CHC. So we're a community-based nonprofit organization and we've been working with teens um, as long as I've been alive, uh, same age as I am. So um, it actually started a long time ago. Esther B. Clark School, which is the uh, schools that I, I direct, is actually named after the founding pediatrician who realized that kids who had challenges in one area would, would very likely have challenges in other areas too. So for those of you who have kids with maybe learning disabilities or something like that, as you know, that can have an emotional and a behavioral impact on, on their lives as well. So she started this interdisciplinary uh, agency, and it is the hallmark of how we provide services to families and kids. We make sure that uh, the whole child is looked at um, and taking care of all the different components that make up our, our kids today. And this is uh, EdRev, and if you don't know about EdRev, uh, it's going to take place on April 21st at AT&T Park. It's a family affair. Um, as you can see, it's an expo, so not only will there be workshops and discussion groups for parents, but there's, uh, the kids will be able to access uh, the playing field, run around the bases, there's face painting, jump hoops, all kinds of things. It's very much of a family, um, family affair, and it is free. So um, we we're, we're expecting over 2,000 people to attend that. All right. So this is the dense agenda that we have tonight. Um, I'm going to do my best to cover it without overwhelming you, uh, but what I want to do is cover each section and then take questions, okay? So record your questions, and then I promise at the end of each section, I'll give you some opportunity to ask me some questions, okay? So the first thing, uh, in order to be knowledgeable about participating in the IEP process, all of you had to go, uh, your kids had to be tested for eligibility, okay? Everybody familiar with that? Yes, no, okay? So there's a lot of numbers, there's a lot of different kind of testing, and those scores and the scores and the kinds of tests they give are actually supposed to be directly rated, related to the IEP goals that you are gonna develop as part, of the, as part of that process. So we're gonna start with the testing and which kinds of tests actually help you to determine which goals, where, where you wanna write your IEP goals, and other tests that help you determine what kinds of accommodations or modifications you're looking for in the IEP. And they're not the same, okay? And I'll, I, I, hope, I hope I'll make that clear and, and, and um, clarify all that. All right, first of all, to be eligible, a school district is obligated to give a series of tests or assessments um, not just in one area of suspected disability, but in all areas. So this cognitive testing, um, except for certain uh, cultural, uh, cultural people, uh, families, achievement testing, and rating scales for social and emotional behavior. That is typically the, the core three uh, triad of testing that you should at least be able to get, okay, if you're getting eligibility. Others that may be necessary are language in the receptive and expressive areas. Um, you may get an OT assessment if sensory issues uh, are, are an issue, and then something called visual and or, and or auditory processing, and we'll go, I'll explain what that is a little bit more. But the top three, cognitive testing, achievement testing, and rating scales for social, emotional, behavior, or executive functioning are absolutely, um, should actually be included in any eligibility testing. Okay, so one of the things I wanna explain about cognitive testing is it is actually a test of scholastic aptitude. It's overly generalized to be intellectual testing, but it doesn't test all kinds of different areas and, and attributes and areas of the brain. So the IQ test that your kids get is basically measuring their ability to be scholastically proficient, okay? Not all, in all their intelligences. For example, it does not test at all mechanical reasoning ability, okay? So all the tests are very, um, very much focused towards their scholastic aptitude or where they're going to have relative strengths and where they're gonna have relative weaknesses. Um, then other areas such as so social-emotional, 
may be impacting their performance in school. This is where we're going to discover whether they have emotional challenges, whether they're anxious, whether they're depressed, whether they have uh, something called disruptive mood dysregulation, um, ADHD, all of those factors. And we want to be able to identify that so we understand the obstacles that kids have, the challenges that they have, and be able to either A, circumvent them, or B, uh, find an intervention that's going to be effective in mitigating those symptoms. All right, so we're going to talk about standard scores. Um, they're the most difficult to understand, but they're the most important because they're the most reliable scores that you see when you get your testing scores back. Generally speaking, what the standard scores are going to tell you is whether your youngster is in the average range, in the above average range, or in the below average range. And that's, you don't have to be specific in terms of those numbers, though I'll show you the bell curve, but um, basically that's what, that's what we're showing. So relative strengths and weaknesses, and here you go. So scores typically in both achievement testing and intellectual testing is between 90 and 110, you're in the average range. Okay, those are kids that are in the average range. So if you see a, an SS, and a, and a number between 90 and 110, your youngster is performing in the average range or in the 50th percentile. Scores that are below 90, and actually, I, I will tell you, the school districts actually extend this number to 85 to 115, okay? They may extend those numbers to 85 and 115. I won't tell you why, but um, they do. So below 85 is considered to be in the low average range up to about 70. So 70 to 85 standard scores are below average, which means the youngster is going to have difficulty making a year's progress for a year's of instruction, okay? And then uh, on the other side, at 115 to about 130, your kids are, are ready for accelerated learning okay, opportunities. Now. What we see with a lot of kids are scattered scores, which range, we will see some scores in the 80s and other scores in the 105s or, or in the 100s. So that, that tells us the learning profile of your youngster and, and helps professionals understand how they can work with the strengths and then remediate or do interventions with the, weakness, with the weaker areas. And you're going you're gonna to experience this, some, of, some of it right now. We're going to talk about the five areas that they test in intellectual testing. These are them uh, up here, verbal comprehension, visual spatial reasoning, fluid reasoning, working memory, and processing speed. And they all play significant factors into how successful a youngster can be um, in, in a classroom. I, didn't say, like, I apologize for my voice. Of course, I came down with laryngitis like 24 hours ago. So I, I don't really actually sound like this. <laughs> All right, let's do the first one. The first one is verbal comprehension. And as you can see up on the slides, one of the most important skills that kids have and one, uh, a, a skill that really facilitates or presents obstacles to learning is for the youngster to be able to make associations. We, research has shown that when kids can make associations, they actually are able to learn more. They can, they can see the connections from one thing to another, from one element to another, from one skill to another, from one topic to another. So this, this particular test actually helps us understand if they, can make, if they can see similarities and make associations. It also shows their level of social awareness and judgment and the crystallized knowledge or the long-term knowledge that they have. So this isn't like an achievement test, but basic skills like, um, uh, well, I can't, I can't come up with one, but crystallized knowledge is the stuff that like, what, what does a, an eight-sided or six-sided sign that's red say. Okay, it says stop, right? Just basic knowledge like that, long-term memory. Um, and then the problems that they give them are a kind of assess whether they're flexible or not, whether they think really rigidly or whether they can see a different perception in looking at a, a particular issue. All right, next one is visual spatial. So in the first one, in this, t in this test, there's a lot of communication, a lot of language communication between the assessor and the, um, and the client or the student. In this one, there's very little, because what we want to test to see is their visual spatial reasoning and take language components right out of it. So analyzing and recreating visual images, you're going to get a chance to do that. Um, perceiving rel relations of one object to another, 
attending to graphic detail. And again, they're gonna, you're going to see similarities um, and, and making associations. So I'm going to give you an exercise right now. That will be one of the questions that would be asked of the kids, which what goes in the question mark. Anybody want to hazard a guess? One is correct, right? Your visual spatial reasoning is solid. Try another one. Which one? Two or four? You sure? <laughs> Two or four? Four. Right. Good. Okay. All right. So that's that. That you see, you didn't have to say anything except for the number. So you're 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 manipulating objects in space. And one of the things that actually this, uh, this test and fluid reasoning do is give us some idea if numbers and quantities also make sense to kids. So kids who st really struggle in math are going to struggle with these kind of, um, these kind of exercises because they're having trouble visualizing the manipulation of quantities when they're trying to do arithmetic. Okay? So this is another one that kind of looks at that as well. Um, the ability to be able to do quantitative reasoning, as I've just explained, demonstrating parts to whole. Uh, and again, this helps us understand their ability to do both deductive, which is finding the right answer, or inductive, which is ex actually expanding on an idea um, by doing the, some of these exercises. This, is, again, is a very minimal language test. So there you go. What goes in the question mark? Anybody guess? Two. Why'd you say two? First picture has a circle and a square. Good. And the star is the only other weight. Good. Okay. So you're doing, you see how you're doing logical reasoning? Abstract logical thinking. You're, you have to put those components together. Excellent. One more. Yeah, four is correct. That's right. Okay, you have to take into consideration two dimensions, both the both the vertical and the horizontal lines. Okay. <laughs> Some people find that fun. Now I can tell you that the kids who don't do well in these tests don't find this fun at all. Okay, they actually don't find it fun. Um, inter interestingly, how, how many of you suspect that your youngster has a learning difference in language areas? They love these. Okay. Um, the kids who have mathematical difficulties don't like these tests at all. It shows in, it shows in their profile. You know, I, actually, I, I did an IQ test. Like I, I did this IQ test. And I, I knew when, I, when the directions were given to me which ones I could do well on and which ones I couldn't. So to give you an idea, um, the subtest scores range from 1 to 19. And I had a number of scores at 19, and I had th two scores in three at 3. So the psychologists were totally baffled by me. Um, they couldn't put a diagnosis on it, really, because no, normally you don't have that kind of range between tests. Okay, working memory. Now, working memory is kind of a, a, a tricky thing to understand. Um, if you could picture right now this counter sort of full of knowledge, new knowledge, like, like I'm pouring at you right now. Okay, uh, just picture all of this being filled up with the, the new knowledge I'm trying to give you. And then I add one more topic, and that table's already full. What happens? Some of it falls off. Okay, that's what happens when working memories get overloaded and kids can't remember everything that they have been presented with. Especially that's true in the higher grades when you get up and you have to draw from long-term memory and bring up previous knowledge and add it to the new knowledge you've got and come up with some kind of response in a discussion group. 
Okay, this is where a lot of kids that we see who have anxiety and depression become very concerned about their performance because they can't remember, they can't pull it all up, or they don't have a big enough table to store all the information that's being given to them in a classroom. This is just a, a little bit of a, of a diagram for this. One of the things that helps kids, and I know a lot of kids hate this, but if you notice the word rehearsal up there, it is really important if we want kids to really register new information into long-term memory that they have an opportunity to rehearse it. And sometimes in classrooms, we just don't give them enough rehearsal time. Now, rehearsal time can be anything like working with a peer, teaching, uh, teaching a peer. It can be um, guided practice. It can be something that they do choral, chorally on, it, on the board. But that kind of, it, it's kind of rehearsing what that process or what that new skill is. And unless we give time, enough time for kids to be able to do that, what you get for homework hasn't been rehearsed enough and it's decayed and it's forgotten by the time they get home. And when they tell you that they can't do parts of their homework, that is a lot of times one of the issues that they're struggling with and it actually shows up on their IQ test because they will have lower scores in, in this thing called working memory. All right, the other major problem that kids have in school that we see more and more of is this thing called processing speed, which is, uh, which is really the devil. Um, and processing speed basically means how fast can you take in the information that I'm giving you, again, pull up your knowledge and give me a response, okay, instantaneously. Because, for example, if I ask this nice gentleman here, a question in a discussion, he has about three seconds to be able to respond to me, or everybody starts going, he doesn't know the answer. Okay, that's a, that's a sort of a standard rule. And there are ways, we're gonna, I'm gonna, I, I could describe lots of ways that I could mitigate that, but when kids can't do something quickly, they get very concerned, because the myth, the biggest myth going out here today is that faster is smarter. And we can't seem to get rid of that. And so with Common Core curriculum, kids are getting more information, more er earlier and faster, and they're being required to respond faster. And this issue is causing an awful lot of emotional issues because they simply don't have thinking time. They're not given processing or thinking time. So uh, we, could do the, we could do an exercise. The exercise is basically um, done like this. This is called visual processing. And what we do is you can see that there's a, a number and a, and a symbol. And basically what I would say to you is, okay, ready? Go, match the symbol to the number, and you, I would give you like a minute and a half to be able to finish as many of those as you can. Now, those of you with efficient processing speed or very good logical reasoning would be able to do that. But if you don't have good processing speed, you find yourself getting to about here because you have to keep looking back and, keep, and, and then going back to the back to the major stimulus. You, you can also see this issue. How many of you have teachers that give timed time timetables? You know, the timetable, they start the math class, and ready, go. Anybody get anybody have that? Okay, that's a processing speed problem. It's, it doesn't measure whether they actually know the times tables. It measures how automatically they know the times tables, and kids with processing speed actually have what we call manual transmissions. They don't have automatic transmissions. They have to actually think about e each of the problems that they do. Doesn't mean they can't, but they get penalized on this thing called processing speed. Okay, so here's, here's some other areas that it, it comes to recall of math facts, hesitant or disfluent um, speech, because they're trying to think through when they've been called on, uh, poor note-taking skills, they're, they're not keeping up with a lecture like this, Delayed response to discussion questions and hardships keeping up with teenage conversations. See, it has social impact as well. When kids need time to think and process and the teens are doing this and back and forth, they, these kids actually lose those conversations and they can't keep up with it. And that makes it hard for them to sustain relationships as they get into the teens. Okay, I'm gonna just go very quickly through here. These are, um, these are the basic achievement tests that, that come oral expression, listening, comprehension, um, written expression. What we look for uh, with the kids that um, we work with particularly is a lot of our kids will show a lot of aptitude up here. They listen very well and they can speak very well. Um, those of you who have kids who are struggling with uh, reading and writing, 
the right, right here and right here, these scores are gonna be significantly lower. But what it tells us is these kids are actually able to take in a lot of language and they are able to learn very well through a certain modality. But if you change the modality to symbolic, then you get down to here and, you can, and this is where they struggle a lot more. So what happens is you can see that these scores, the, what they do is you get a lot of variability. And the, that variability is actually helping professionals like myself and the clinicians here at CHC and whoever you're working with <coughs> understand the relative areas of strength that your youngster has and the areas that are going to need to be addressed. And that's what I want you folks to know when you walk into an IEP is how those numbers actually are going to play into the construction of your IEP. All right, um, just a little bit on executive functioning, which is a big thing now. Uh, it's, it's, it's gained a lot of attention of researchers. These are the different areas that are tested um, in executive functioning. Unfortunately, the assessment tools that we've been using um, are not as reliable as we'd like yet. We're still learning an awful lot, and there are actually uh, a, a lot of different um, <laughs> perceptions and beliefs about what executive function is and isn't. Um, so I'm going to kind of go through this more quickly because these are less re less reliable tests right now. But it does tell it does give us an idea of some of these characteristics, like a, a person's ability to be able to inhibit. That is, instead of blurting out that inappropriate response, they can have an inside they have an inside voice. But sometimes when you don't inhibit well, your inside voice actually becomes your outside voice, and that's what gets them into trouble. That's what in inhibition is not. Shifting is being able to transition from one topic to another, and that's a, um, actually, this is a very difficult task that we ask kids to do on a regular basis. In fact, at the end of, from, if they go to, if they go to English or language arts from 8.30 to 9.20, and then we switch it to math, that is a completely co different cognitive task that we're asking them to do, and we're giving them a five minute passing period to be able to actually switch their whole cognitive domain. It's not the way we live as, as human beings, as adults. We don't ask, we don't do that kind of shifting, but kids in school are, are asked to do a lot of shifting like that. Obviously, regulating your emotions is something that um, is important in class. The ability to be able to initiate a task um, and understand how, what it is to initiate a task. Time and material management is oftentimes a, a struggle for kids, and we, can, and we can begin to identify those as being issues. Um, and then being able to self-monitor, which is basically involving uh, editing, self-checking, and just taking a little bit of a, a moment to say, am I okay? Am I emotionally regu regulated? Am I paying attention? Um, do I understand what's going on? Do I need to ask a question? All of those kind of things are, ca are captured in um, executive functioning. All right, one more set of tests, and then we're gonna, I'll take some questions. So now we're gonna get down to the rating scales. These are the behavior, emotional, um, uh, behavior and emotional rating scales. Now there's a very different scoring system here, so bear with me. We're gonna talk about T scores. Now everything I told you about standard scores, you're gonna like uh, eliminate, obliterate for just a few minutes here. Because you're gonna read these scores as T scores, okay? And basically what you wanna understand is that anything above 60 on a, on a rating scale is clinically significant. That means it's a, those symptoms of whatever they are testing, anxiety, withdrawal, learning problems, conduct problems, externalizing behavior, that's, that, that is a, an obstacle. It is a serious issue that the kids are dealing with and it's been identified by usually three or four people, okay? Most rating scales are gonna, are gonna be handed to parents, they're gonna be handed to teachers, and so the combined information we get from parents and teachers are gonna tell us if these, if these are pervasive problems or if they're situational problems, okay? So 60 to 80 uh, usually means clinically problematic, and if they're very low, below 39, then they're having trouble with um, uh, ad adapting to that particular situation. So kids who are in between um, the, the 40 and 59 range are, are in the average range, okay? Here are some examples of some of the rating scales that you may use. Now, the interesting thing is um, that, if you'll pardon me, neither parents nor teachers are very reliable reporters on this. <laughs> so we oftentimes see scores that are like um, almost 100, which means really off the charts. 
And I just know the person who signed that must have just had an incident with that youngster and then signed up the rating scale because it, that's, that they really are. I mean, kids who are severely psychiatrically disordered have those numbers, but that's not actually representative of most of the kids that we have. Um, on the other hand, moms, we sometimes see you minimize issues and um, everybody else has them sort of at risk and clinically significant and sometimes we see a parent put the youngster right down the middle and say oh, everything's just fine um, and that's discrepant as well. But that we have to take all that consi into consideration and, um, and, and that it just helps us paint the picture that we're trying to paint um, for the IEP. All right, so let's keep it simple. So there, here's a summary thing if you want to just obliterate everything else. In understanding your scores, remember that your standard scores up here, are, there's your above average. Your above average scores on T-scores are problematic, okay? Those are, pro that's why I put it in red. 61 to 80 is going to be a, a, an issue that we want to be addressing. Um, and then you'll, you'll see below average is uh, your 40 to 89 and your 20. Uh, 20 to 39 is not adapting or withdrawing, okay? So put your mind at rest. If you, your score's here, okay, mean you're, it means your answers are just fine, okay? In that particular area, they're just fine and you don't have to worry about them, okay? So that's what I want you to do is begin to see the youngsters in these different components as opposed to just one person having a challenge, okay? Because that's how we have to do it. We, we're not gonna be able to change the youngsters, but we can change environments and we can intervene on certain kinds of skill and topic issues to help kids feel better and do better uh, both at school and in, in, your, in the community. All right, uh, let me take some questions if you have questions on testing, we're done. You did, that's the most clinical part. Yes? Of all the tests that you mentioned, is there an age for them? Is it equal for the kindergartner? And yes. the second question was about the uh, processing, uh, slow processing. So it looks like there goes into two different type of people that can be their slow processors and their fast processors. Yes. Does one ever convert to the other? Or, you know, uh, can we help a child? Because like you said, our society is more based on speed. Speed, yeah. And, and volume. Speed and volume. How do we set them up to be successful, and can we actually be changing them? Is that a, is that a expectation right. we have? Yes. Great question. Ever hear the question? Can you change processing speeds? Uh, we can mitigate them, but the accommodations have to come from me as the instructor. Okay, I have to make the accommodations. I actually have to provide think time for kids with processing problems. If I don't, I, I mean, I can't change their brain. Their speed of response is their speed of response. And the, and the concern they have and the myth that we need to, to de just demystify for these kids is speed is not intelligence, it is not. There is nowhere in any research that says the fastest kids doing the work are the smartest kids. The fastest kids are the 131s and all the way across, okay? That's not true. There are very, very bright kids who take think time. Um, and in fact, as an employer, I'm not looking for somebody to give me a fast response on my treatment teams. I'm looking for them to be thoughtful. I'm looking for them to do some investigation and then come back to me with a, with, with a response of how we should intervene on somebody. So I'm not actually valuing a lot of speed. Now, I know in technology, and this is where we're getting the speed, is the faster the computer g computers get and the more they're able to store information, there is an implicit sense that the human brain is doing the same thing, that we're evolving as quickly as computers are being constructed. And that's simply just not true. It's just not true. We are not like computers, and we have our own processing speed, and we have our own limitations of memory. And that's really important. It's really important for us to understand because we're just not going to be able to change memory loads in kids, and we're not going to be able to change their processing speed all that much. Okay. And it, to call it a disability is a disservice because when we start calling those things disabilities, that's when kids get anxious and depressed, and they and they start really worrying about whether they're okay or not. And that's the bigger issue that we're dealing with today. I have a child who's more on the emotional spectrum of this. Mm -hmm. um, so I would assume that academically things are actually pretty okay. When I um, and we're in the process of testing them now, when I go into the IEP, if I feel like something 
doesn't quite jive with what I understand. Um, because I know he's taken them on a day where he's not in a great mood. Yep. Can't, can I ask to have him retested or do I just let them? That's a good question on testing. So the kinds of tests that I've shown you are what they call normative tests. And there are, there's a, a, a time frame that you can't retest youngsters with that particular instrument. What you can ask for is a retest using a similar instrument that tests the same area, okay? But you can't retake the whole, you can't retake the test. And most of these tests have different, um, uh, different formats and they have different publishers and uh, that's, hard, that's a hard one, yep. Um, so it seems like the score numbers are sort of universal. That's the number and that's what it means. How does that relate to, or is there that same consistency with this number means the kid qualifies for school? Yes, okay, There's, that's a great question. So for many years, um, the way youngsters were identified for special education was based on something called a discrepancy formula. And that meant that they looked at the IQ scores, and if you had, say, for example, an IQ score, a, a full-scale IQ score, and I'm combining all five of the uh, subtests, of, say, 100, okay, which would be absolutely in the 50th percentile average, and you had a specific area in the academics that was one and a half standard deviations lower, which would mean that their standard score was about 84 or lower, then they would qualify for special education under that service, okay? There are, I think, some districts and some cl clinicians who still abide by that, although it has been mitigated in terms of being the only qualifier for special education. Okay, so everybody understand what I just said? So you look at those numbers, and if there's discrepancies between the IQ scores and an achievement score area, that used to automatically qualify something if there were X number of points between the IQ score and the achievement test score. It still counts, and you should be aware of that. That discrepancy means there's an issue, but it is not the only qualifier for becoming eligible for special education, okay? And you, you do need to know that. Um, there are, I'm, I'm gonna tell you at the, end of the, at the end of the night, there are actually some really good training classes specifically that can work with your IEPs um, and, and help you through it. But um, the, the actual IEP training course <coughs> is about 15 hours. So we're not gonna do 15 hours tonight, I promise you, we will not do that. Um, but there are so many nuances in IEPs that, um, that you know, having somebody help you or coach you who's been through this um, is, really a, is really a helpful um, process, especially if you're early on in, this, in, in getting used to IEPs. Any other questions on testing before we actually move to IEPs? Yeah. How much of a concern is there um, for the subtests? If some of the subtests are really low, but the overall score is average. Well, the reason I actually the reason I showed you that—that's a really good question. Everybody hear that question? The, what happens if you have some low subtest scores? So those—it it just shows that those areas are going to are likely to reflect a problem that they're gonna have in an academic area. Now, it may or may not, we, all, we do see a high correlation between lower visual, spatial, and fluid reasoning, and then math achievement scores that are correspondingly low because they, they require the same cognitive skill. In processing speed, we're gonna see lower reading comprehension scores. Any of the tests that are timed and kids have processing speed problems, we're gonna see proportionally lower scores and the achievement side. So you, we, to, to give you a little preview, we can't write IEP goals off of the cognitive testing. It, everything's gonna be done off the achievement testing. And I'm gonna show you how, how that's gonna work in just a second. Any other questions? Yep. I volunteer at Bellhaven School uh, and I did that today. And the teacher said, I'll be sure you check this particular reader's comprehension. And so I did the best I could. I'm not trained. I have no, I have no uh, profile on what this kid is all about. He reads beautifully with lots of expression. And when I started asking him questions about what he read, his comprehension was way down. And I had no, I have no idea now. The next time I see him, what to do? Well, I can't tell you what to do, but I can tell you what it means. Okay. So, um, anybody else have? kids with the same issue, they actually decode well, but lose the comprehension. 
So there are, a couple of, there are a couple of issues that happen with that. One is they are putting tremendous amounts of mental energy into decoding the words, and the idea of actually trying to understand it at the same time is overwhelming. Okay, these are kids who actually have to do homework twice, which is very discouraging for them. The other thing that can happen is reading comprehension at an earlier and earlier age, and you may see this, um, I'm, I'm actually seeing this kind of uh, criteria or topic on report cards as young as third grade, is inferential comprehension, which is abstract thinking levels. Now, I, I mean, I don't study human development all that much, but it's a far, it's a far cry for a lot of eight-year-olds to be doing abstract reasoning. So oh, why would they be able to do inferential comprehension from a book? Okay, and that's, it, it, this is what's happening, is we're trying to get kids to do things at an earlier age, and it's not actually lining up with brain development. And brain development, incidentally, is also pretty heterogeneic. We can look at certain times of, the, of a youngster's life that we should be seeing the development of that, but we are asking kids today in schools to do things that we pretty much know if we've studied the brain. They are not, their brain has not developed to be able to do it except create anxiety in them. Yes? <coughs> you had just said about um, the age for inferring, uh, for the answering inferior questions or something. My daughter is 13 years, she's 12 years old right now, and she's in seventh grade. And that's the problem that she has. She has that inferior, uh, answering those inferior questions. So at what age or how do you help them to to, to be more um, in the average side of, of answering those. Yeah, so, so as they get into teens and they're having difficulty with inferential, that's an area we're gonna talk about and maybe that maybe requires some services, okay? I, I, I can't tell you exactly how you're gonna do that, but it's an area that you want addressed when you enter, go and you go into your IEP meeting, okay? Uh, we'll show you how to do that. All right, let's move on. Okay, when a test score falls into the red zone, the IEP team should consider developing an IE, IEP goal to address that area of def, deficit, okay? But all the scores in the red, and when I meant red, I was taking you back to this one, okay, these scores. But all these scores may not be malleable, okay? So an IEP goal wouldn't be appropriate, and I'm gonna help you straighten that out. So I don't want you to you know, take every low score and say you need 100, you need you know, 40, 40 goals because we've got to address each of those red areas. The IEP team will determine whether the areas of deficit require accommodations, modifications, an intervention, or remediation. Okay, and so I'm going to take you through all of those because as important as IEP goals are, for many kids in the middle school and high school area, it's just it's going to be more important for the accommodations and the modifications to be developed and then communicate it to every teacher so that they have those accommodations and modification all day long, regardless of what subject matter they're in. Okay, and this is where, this is where we're having a lot of problems in, in gen ed. Um, kids who wanna be in gen ed, who have the cognitive capacity of learning the content at gen ed, but they need accommodations and they're not getting them because Mr. Smith has decided they do it my way or the highway, okay? And this is part of the IEP part that you, that you want to you know, learn assertiveness or become assertive. All right, so I'm not going to go into this. this is, these are all the idealistic things that are supposed to happen in an IEP meeting. Um, it is supposed to be about your youngster. Um, and one of the most important skills that you have as a parent is to continually direct the administrators or whoever you're speaking with from the district onto the fact that you're talking about the, my child and my child's needs, okay? We're not talking about whether the district has resources. We're not talking about how expensive it is. We don't talk about whether the teacher is qualified or not, or they don't have a specialist in that area. You talk about what your youngster needs and you are totally within the law, okay? What your youngster needs. Now, what your youngster needs and what you may want may not totally jive up. You're entitled to what you, he needs, you're not always entitled to what you want. Okay, and that's what I wanna, that I wanna point that out. Some, and, and I'll give you the best example. If, as, you, as you go through this journey, you will see, especially in the technology areas, that there's all kinds of 
things coming on board that actually help kids access curriculum better. Some of the ones are gonna be very pertinent to your youngster perhaps, and some of them are not. So just to say, I want assistive technology, you're not gonna get every device, okay? That's not gonna be offered to you. One of the things that I'm gonna encourage you to, to do as if you, if you look at assistive technology is talk to some experts in assistive technology about the specific kinds of assistive technology that would benefit your youngster. There's a ton out there. Um, and so understanding exactly which tools your youngster needs is gonna be really important. And um, I'm gonna give you the name of an organization that has an, an iTech lab. Um, I, I just visited this morning, it's terrific, and they have actually have people who will sit down with you and talk about exactly what kind of tools will benefit your youngster. Okay, so uh, I mean, at times you're gonna get into this issue, well, we don't have it, or I have no more room in, the ro in that resource room, or whatever it is, and you just say, my kid needs, this is what my youngster needs. These are the things my youngster needs. All right, environments. Uh, everybody familiar with least restrictive and less restrictive and most restrictive? Okay, just to go quickly over that. So it is federal mandate that youngsters, that all youngsters should be in what they call the least restrictive environment, and that is the premise that your youngster deserves to be with neurotypical peers in a in an environment that allows the greatest amount of flexibility and socialization and extracurricular activities as possible. Now, the, and then be, uh, and then be given the opportunity to have uh, grade level curriculum taught and practiced. So that works for most kids, okay? But it doesn't work for all kids. And um, you will come across this issue as you deal with IEPs of, of this federal mandate be putting people in the least restrictive environment. Um, the most restrictive environments are environments like mine, which is, uh, I, have, I have what's called a therapeutic milieu. It's called a non-public school. And that means that the youngsters are being um, transported to us outside the district. Uh, and we are considered one of the most restrictive environments because we are taking kids away from their neighborhood communities um, and placing them into a homogeneous and therapeutic I think they would call it a synthetic setting so that we can do the work and the intervention that's needed with our kids. So the hidden part of this is as you go up this ladder, you, the cost per student is going to rise quite dramatically, okay? It is the white elephant, um, I shouldn't be saying this, but I, it's, it's true, this is the white elephant in every IEP room, okay? It is the white elephant. Nobody can talk about it. You can't, I mean, you, they, they won't, talk about the resources that they have or the fact that this is more expensive. What they will do is, what the district will do is focus on the fact that they deserve the opportunity to be with like peers in the most open uh, and have the most access to core curriculum opportunities and socializing, okay? Now, I, I tend to agree with that if the youngsters feel okay about being in that environment. but. When youngsters actually don't feel good because they can't keep up with the Joneses, and I'm not, and I'm using the word can't because there are parts of them that can't do what Billy and Jeannie do in the mainstream class, then it isn't the best opportunity for them. And they need some specialized intervention, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And, the, and oftentimes, you'll get, um, you'll get some services that are directly in the areas of skill deficit um, in, this, in this kind of environment. Those are your resource rooms. Those are your in-district special day classes. Um, they actually may even include one-to-one -one behavioral aids so kids can stay in their neighborhood um, school. All right, so I wanna make sure everybody understands this. This is very important um, in terms of your IEPs to understand the difference to what, when people use, when the district uses the word accommodation, it's really important that you understand what that means. It's a change that helps students overcome or work around a specific skill deficit, but doesn't change what the targeted outcome is to be. So the best example I can give you, the easiest example I'll give you is, if a youngster has a written expression disorder, they should have the opportunity, if the, if the goal is to learn the content of a particular unit, they should have the opportunity to take that test orally and be graded on the same rubric as the kids are who are getting it on, as, written, as a written exercise. Okay, so you're not changing the questions, 
you're only changing the format of how kids are allowed to respond to the particular task at hand. They're graded on the same rubric as neurotypical kids who are dealing, and they are required to meet the same standards. The only change is the format or the way they're going to go about expressing that knowledge. Okay, does everybody understand that? If you start changing any of those other variables, you're talking about modifications. Now, why do I want you to understand the difference? Because as you get into high school, it, you, accommodations will not affect credits or the type of credits that you're getting. Modifications will definitely affect credit accumulation. Okay, so you, I want you to be very clear about the difference between an accommodation and a modification. So here are some examples. Teachers provide notes and outlines, okay, because if the goal is not note-taking, then the, and the goal is to master or di um, display or exhibit to the teacher how much you've understood about a topic unit, then asking for the teacher-provided notes or outlines is absolutely reasonable, okay? As long as the skill is not note-taking. Everybody see the difference? So for example, you won't get a calculator for a calculation math test. You can't ask for that because obviously you can just take the calculator and do the calculations. But in a math problem solving task, that's when the calculator, when you're looking at how do you solve a problem, a tool like a calculator becomes a, a reasonable accommodation. Okay, allows use of wider line paper for written tasks. It can be oral, um, oral exams. You can ask for things like textbooks on audio, okay, text-to-speech, text or, yeah, text-to-speech. And, and the kids are beginning to learn in our school speech-to-text. So they're taking their, actually, they're creating their essays verbally and then putting them onto text so they can hand, hand them into the teacher. No change in the grading system. They are required to meet the same standards that every other youngster in the class is required to make. Okay? Everybody understand that? A modification is being changed what's taught or, or the caliber of work. So, for example, if you have a youngster who is um, really seriously behind in reading and the textbook at the 10th grade level is not going to be a feasible way for them to get the information and they're given a 5th grade level textbook, that is a modification. Okay, they are not using the same materials and they won't be required to do exactly the same caliber or quantity of work as other kids are. Um, so, uh, and this is, this is interesting, how much of a work reduction is an accommodation versus a modification? I get asked that all the time. So basically, if a youngster does 80% or more of the required workload, you can consider that an accommodation. Anything less is probably going to be considered a modification. Okay, and certainly excusal from doing homework if every other youngster is required to do homework is going to be a modification. Okay? Everybody see the difference? The difference in, if, you're, if your youngster is using different materials than the rest of the class, then that curriculum is being modified. Now, I'm not making a value judgment because for some kids that's really important. It actually allows them to be in the less restrictive environment and be working with the, p the peers in, in, in your community schools, okay? It all depends upon you, the receptivity of your youngster. If your youngster feels good about that, then that's great, okay? What we get concerned about are the kids who get very worried when this has to happen, when they realize that they have different materials and what does that mean about them? When the emotional issues start taking over their ability to be ready and available for academic instruction. All right, so an intervention is actually a planned set of procedures that are aimed at reteaching or building up a deficient skill, okay? Now, most of the time what we see is this in the behavioral realm where we have behavior intervention plans that are designed to extinguish the maladaptive behavior and replace it with a pro-social behavior so the kids can be with their peers. How many people have a behavior intervention uh, support plan? Anybody? Okay, one, two. Okay, so those behavior support plans are actually interventions based, and they're oftentimes based on data collection. So we target a behavior or we target a skill, 
we provide an intervention with the expectation that we're going to have a measurable impact on that, on that particular skill area, be it academic or social or behavioral. Um, it usually requires some specialist who's going to deliver that particular service. Okay, it isn't something done by the teacher, generally speaking. Now, unlike an accommodation and a modification, this is going to address the skill and attempt to elevate its relative strength. Okay, accommodations and modifications do not strengthen any deficit skill. They are workarounds in order to give kids access to a more generalized thing, which is why you need to understand that accommodations aren't going to fix anything. They're going to help kids work around. But if we have a skill that needs to be dealt with in, and because it's an obstacle for youngsters to be in a classroom successfully, we have to do an intervention. Okay? And this is where your services come in. Okay, and I'll be talking about this. this is, these require changes in service pages and goals. And incidentally, every intervention that we do requires us to write an IEP goal. Okay, intended to produce a measurable change. I've said this, the individualized support plan, address a, a child's chronic propensity to swear at the teacher, run out of the classroom when an assignment, feedback um, requires the teacher to perform some editing. It, you know, those can be the target behaviors. And we are going to actually intervene and extinguish those maladaptive behaviors through an intervention and through goal setting so that they, um, th so that those issues are mitigated. Okay, so remediation is also, and this has actually been downplayed a lot, which is too bad. So remediation is also a directed intervention designed to elevate deficient skills. Um, and, it's an, and it's usually specifically related to advanced or specialized instruction in academic areas. So an intervention may be more social, emotional, and behavior. Remediation is actually probably more directed toward academics, um, elevating um, reading, writh reading, writing, or mathematics skills, okay? And it's designed to bring an underskilled student closer, notice I said closer, to the skill level competency expected at the grade level. This too is directly providing instruction on a deficient skill and requires us to write an IEP goal and develop a service for it, okay? So your interventions and your remediations require IEP goals and, and should provide you with some kind of um, specialized service or specialized academic instruction. And your accommodations and your modifications are going to be support systems that help kids work around those skill deficits that they have in order to access grade level curriculum and or be socializing with their peers. Everybody understand those, the difference between those two? <coughs> Interventions are around social emotional behaviors and remediation is designed to elevate skills around math. And yes, yeah. They're, they're, they're basically synonyms. So interventions are, are usually um, more associated with behavior or, so, or emotional or social um, development, whereas the word remediation is gonna be more academic skills. Yeah. Would you ever have an IEP with just accommodation? Yep, sure would. And would there be goals then if accommodation? No, no, but the accommodation, so uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna deviate here for a second because I want everybody to understand this. How many people know about 504 plans? Okay, so 504 plans lack the legality of implementation that an IEP does. 504 plans are really helpful if you want to titrate your youngster down from interventions. They are very hard to have people enforce as if this is your initial sort of foray into specialized services. It, no teacher is actually legally required to implement a 504 plan. Okay, you're basing, you're basing your hopes on somebody being compassionate and knowledgeable to uh, make the accommodations that are probably listed on a 504 plan. If you can possibly get it, and this is what I talk about all, a lot, you want the IEP because then it's a legal contract and every single teacher is responsible for understanding, knowing, and implementing every accommodation that's on that, on that sheet, okay, regardless of what subject area they teach. Okay, everybody, everybody understand that? It, the IEP is your legally binding document 
And if it's signed by the district and you, it is absolutely implementable and has to be implemented across all, all academic uh, and subject domains. So does that mean that you don't, I mean, do you need a 504 plan? So if you have an IEP, is there a reason to have a 504 plan? No, no. Sometimes, um, so let me, so this is where I found 504 plans to be really helpful. So youngsters who have been on IEPs and they're um, entering their junior or senior year in high school and you're trying to build their sense of autonomy and self-advocacy and they've done well under the IEP, that's when you can look at a 504 plan because you know the youngster's going to have the capacity and the knowledge of how to self-advocate for what they need. You're not doing it anymore, they're doing it. And then a 504 plan can be quite effective. Yes? Have you heard of any district saying that a child who has not had a track record in a public school or the school district needs to have a 504 plan before they'll be able to have that? That's, there's no legal precedence to that at all. There's no prerequisite of having a 504 plan before you have, um, before you have an IEP. So if a vice president of a school tells you that they really don't have a legal plan? That's, they're not talking out of a knowledgeable base. They're talking about they're talking about fiscal responsibility, maybe, but that's where they're talking at. Yep. The difference of having an IOP with going with your child going to a private school versus getting it from public. Okay. So an IEP is technically only applicable and legally binding in a public school institution. Okay. You may have one in a private school, but the private school, unlike the public school, has the right to say, I, we can't service that. We can't actually deal with that. But can you get services from the public You school? can. Actually, now, uh, um, I, I think California is coming around. Uh, I was in Pennsylvania for a few years in Massachusetts. And in, Massa in, in those two states, if you're in a private school and you qualify for a, what they call a designated instructional service, which is OT, speech and language, behavior skills training, um, and you, and maybe academic re remediation, you can actually um, petition the district who will test you and either qualify you or not and provide you with that designated instructional service. Good questions. Wow, you guys are excellent. Everybody hanging in, okay? Are you understanding my gravelly voice? Is this right, everything? Cool. All right, parents and IEP goals. Okay, so we've gone a little bit over this. <clears throat> I wanna do it again, just to make sure. This is rehearsal and the working memories, you know, what we talked about earlier. <laughs> so with all the numbers and all the reports, and the multi-pages, and incidentally, um, with the kids I work with at San Jose State, I like, pay, I like my feedback from them to be one or two pages. And you guys have to sometimes go through 40-page reports, which are incredibly dense. And one of the reasons that I actually pick these numbers out is you can begin to scan. Instead of reading the descriptions of all the tests, which is a, a constitutes an awful lot of this, if you can look at the graphs and understand what those numbers mean, okay, you will um, save yourself a lot of confusion because there's an awful lot of psychobabble in the narratives of, of these reports. Um, so if they have a baseline score below average, that is, if when you start seeing achievement scores particularly, Okay, we'll start with achievement scores that are below, I would, uh, definitely below 85, and I, I would say 87. There probably should be an IEP goal written for that particular skill domain. If it's been pronounced enough so that it is impacting your youngster um, emotionally in the classroom, or they are, or you're being told by the teacher that that youngster's really not keeping up, they probably also, requires some kind of specialized intervention, specialized academic instruction, or like an intervention or remediation in that particular academic skill, okay? It's that simple. If that score is down there, then you, it doesn't matter what, what a, a, the discrepancy is, that youngster is, has not got the skill base to make a year's progress for a year's worth of instruction, and they're gonna need some support and, and help in doing that. Now, your goal, the goal that's produced always needs to start with a baseline. Do not accept any IEP that does not give you the baseline data of where your youngster's current performance is because the idea behind the goal is that you see a statistically measurable change in your youngster's skill 
proficiency in that particular area where the, where the goal's been written. Now, I, I mean, I've seen really archaic goals, like Billy will learn how to put a period after each sentence. Like, we're gonna talk about how many goals are really feasible, but if you're down to like periods, you're, that's not very serious, to be honest with you, okay? If a youngster cannot express themselves in writing, they can't write a complete sentence, or they write phrases, or they can't construct an expository paragraph if they're in the end of middle school, now you have, that's an issue that needs to be dealt with. They need specialized instruction to be able to do that. All right, on a different page are the accommodations. I, you, can go on to, you can go on to Google, um, you can, uh, access some of these agencies that I'll, I'm uh, an agency that I'm going to talk to you about in just a second to see a list of reasonable accommodations and my suggestion is that you go in with your suggested accommodations as opposed to letting the district formulate their idea of the accommodations which is why I want you to this is why I, I wanted to spend some time on that because those accommodations are going to allow your kid to continue to participate in the environment that they probably really want to be in, which is the less restrictive environment. Okay, I can, I mean, nobody signs up when they're in kindergarten to come to Esther B. Clark School, I can, I can assure you. Okay, it is done on the basis of need, not want. And what we'd like to do is have kids feel good about, the, about being in the less restrictive environment. And I think of all the things that I've seen in IEPs that are, is under, stated and undervalued is the idea of parents knowing the accommodations that their kids need. And then making sure that every teacher who has your kid understands what every single accommodation is and monitoring to make sure they're implementing it. Because it's a violation, it's a legal violation if they do not. And that includes the PE teacher, it includes the recess monitor, it includes everybody who has any interaction with your youngster. It is a legally binding contract. And those accommodations are the most, to me, one of the most important things and probably the area that I would encourage you to educate yourself on as much as you can. All right, but understand that your accommodations are not going to fix or elevate or mitigate the skill deficit that your youngster has in that area. Everybody understand that? You're going to allow your youngster to access grade level curriculum, to be in a less restrictive environment if those accommodations are properly implemented, but it isn't going to fix the problem. Okay, they are workarounds. Now, to be honest with you, a lot of behavior management that we do at Esther B. Clark is mitigating the obstacles in the environment that cause kids to get triggered behaviorally. I mean, that's what we do. We're, I'm not going out and changing a youngster, actually. What we're doing is mitigating the stressors in the environment and then teaching kids or replacing maladaptive responses to that to more pro-social ones. So we're doing an accommodation. One is we're reducing the stressors that cause the youngster to actually have a behavior problem. And then B, we're take, now we're doing the intervention that says we're gonna replace this maladaptive skill with uh, a more pro-social skill. But if we don't also make, make sure the environment becomes more hospitable, then this intervention won't be effective at all, okay? So for those of you who have kids with emotional dysregulation or behavior challenges, both of those are gonna be really important, okay? The intervention and the accommodation. This is what it looks like on a, on a paper, and I actually think they've updated it from them. But you can see it says supplementary aids and services provided to the child on behalf of the program and program modifications or support for it. So this is aids, services, program accommodations, modifications or support. So under that would go speech to text, um, software, okay? That might be one of them. Calculator for problem solving. Um, separate, separate seating um, when they take a test, okay? Uh, fre frequent breaks. All those kinds of things that don't change the way kids are evaluated in school, but help them to work better in the environment that they have to be in. And there are so many of them, you know, really take some time and study them before you go into your IEP or get somebody to help you create them all. Um, and they are, they are really valuable. Now, here's the hardest part, especially for those, how many have kids between fifth and 10th grade? 
fifth and ninth grade. Okay. So you know what the hardest part is? In those ages, kids want to conform. They want to do everything just like everybody else, and they don't want to stick out. And so they are reluctant users of accommodations. In fact, they can be very resistant to the accommodations. You have to try to coach them to use these accommodations because there's no other way they're going to be successful. This isn't a fix. This isn't like a Band-Aid or an injury. It's not an illness. It is, a, it is something that they have to manage. And the way they manage is accepting the fact that they have to do things a little bit differently. That is the hardest task you're going to have. This, is, this part you'll be able to do. You'll be able to write them all down, getting your kids to actually utilize them. And here's why that's important. And this isn't well known. This is not actually well known by districts, fortunately, but um, it, is actually, it is actually part of accommodations. If a youngster does not use the accommodation in the year of that IEP, it can be eliminated. So for example, if your youngster is given extra time on a test and they never take it, it can be removed by the teacher because they never used it and they documented that they never used it. You know why most kids have extended time? It lowers their anxiety. Most of them don't actually use ex extended time, but the knowledge that they know they have the extra time reduces their anxiety and lets them perform better. Remarkable. Think about yourself, though, for a second. Everybody take a GRE or an SAT or it's one of those awful tests. Okay, what happened when, you know, the first five people got up and sort of left? Didn't you feel like, <laughs> right? And you're still <laughs> plugging away on number 40 and you know you have to get to 60, right? So, um, so those, are, uh, those are issues that our kids deal with. Um, but the accommodation of extra time allows kids to at least not feel as anxious about it. So that kind of setting. Yep. Have you heard of talking approaches, talking points with the kids to encourage them? Oh, yeah. Any recommendations there? We, um, well, there are all kinds of, I mean, there are all kinds of people who can do that. Um, a very good educational therapist, an executive functioning coach, a therapist, um, administrators like me. <laughs> I mean, we, we talk to kids about the importance of using those accommodations and why. Now, a lot of the kids are gonna have to go through hardship before they finally relent. And we see a lot of kids actually then begin to use the accommodations when they get to high school. So don't give up if your kid's in middle school. Yep. So this sort of sounds like those, it's left the kid to say, I need this accommodation. Like, you know, sure when they're older, then that yes. seems reasonable, but with younger kids, it seems like it's really the teacher should, that needs to be implementing and offering it yes absolutely yeah In elementary school for sure all right um one thing i want to make sure was is this the right one yeah this is the right one okay so accelerating progress versus catching up most of these conditions because they're brain based and neurological okay are not going to afford the youngsters to accelerate the rate of progress so much that they're actually going to totally catch up with their peers because what happens in, in actually human development is you, so you could picture a staircase, okay? And as, as our kids get closer to catching up to that stair, all of a sudden the expectations increase and they, uh, and they can't jump as quickly as the rest of the neurotypical kids. So they find themselves almost catching up and then falling behind again and almost catching up. And this is particularly true in the social emotional realm where the expectations from elementary peers to middle school peers to high school peers changes quite radically, and the kids aren't, uh, aren't ready to make that kind of quantum leap. Um, so you should see relatively accelerated progress if the, inter if the, if the remediation or intervention is, um, is effective. So for example, I know um, Sand Hill School very closely monitors the progress that the kids are making in um, reading and, and math calculations. And they're looking for their kids to make a little bit more progress than a year. Okay, and they are oftentimes very successful in doing that. But that doesn't mean they've caught up to their grade level peers. Okay, it just means that they're closing the gap a, a, a little bit more. So that the accommodations that they get and that they're entitled to will become more, uh, more effective. So I just want to make sure everybody understands that catching up with a lot of these skills is, pr is not really a feasible target, and uh, you have to be really careful about having that be your target goal, um, which if your kid doesn't make, you sort of inadvertently express disappointment, which you don't want to do. Yeah? What about repeating a year? Repeating a year. So if you're in the public school, special education kids will not be, re will not be retained. They won't be. 
there's no way they will. Um, this is the new. This is the new rule, which is too bad because there are certain youngsters who are globally less mature and would benefit actually from being held back. Um, but that's not an option that public schools are giving. Some th the one, the one retention, if you will, that we sometimes see as effective is if our kids are changing schools. So if they're going from one school to another school, they can go across, you know, across the same grade. That sometimes works, especially if you're doing it in a, um, from a private school to a public school or, or vice versa. But it doesn't always work. But it, that's the only time I've seen retention actually sort of subtly work. They can request it. But I've seen districts absolutely fight it because what they'll do is to say, we're gonna, we'll give them more accommodations or we'll make modifications. And for most kids, retention is uh, psychologically devastating. Everybody knows. I mean, the kids, believe me, kids know when they've been retained. Okay, and the message, the subtle message that gives to them is, I must be dumb, bad, or crazy. Which one am I? Okay, there's, it, it is shown to be very detrimental. Now, with certain kids who do not have social awareness, um, and are intellectually uh, immature, okay, and then social emotionally very immature, so that they have always been struggling. They may agree that that might be a good idea, but um, it's a rare it's a rare youngster that I've seen actually be okay being retained. Okay, it sometimes can happen that you take five years in high school. Like we've talked we've talked to kids about not overloading themselves. Um, because not taking five classes, but taking four and then taking one in the summer and then finishing up a semester behind. And I, we've gotten kids to agree to do that because that's a, that's a volume and a caseload that they can manage better than trying to take five courses at one time. But until you get to high school and can sort of adjust your course loads like this, you will see very little receptivity to retention. Maybe in preschool, you know, and that's why they started transitional kindergartens. Anybody doing a transitional kindergarten? That, that is a way of sort of retaining and not retaining. It's sort of grade K.5 because they're not ready for first grade, okay, or 4.5 to go to kindergarten. And how is aid an accommodation <coughs> and not an intervention? I mean, in my... How's an aid? Okay, so an aid requires a service change and therefore require... And in order to put an aid on somebody, you have to have a goal of why they're putting the aid on it. So that is an intervention. Yes, an inter intervention, right. It's not an accommodation, no. Okay, so this is kind of a graphic example of what we um, can celebrate. This is, the, um, this is the class, okay? And this was, uh, this was Billy without remediation, okay? He didn't get any. See how the gap either stays the same and in some cases early on widens. But Deborah got remediation, okay? Now notice she didn't catch up, but this, is, this represents accelerated progress. Everybody see that? So you, that's the kind of expectation that you can have when you have a service intervention. There should be a measurable improvement or measurable acceleration of whatever skill it is that's been, is being addressed. Okay, now I'll go back to rating skills. Everybody with me? We're gonna go back to those rate, emotional behavior, so, social uh, rating scales. Okay, the object in there is to reduce the symptoms. So when you see a T-score that represents above 60, you know, that 60 to 80 range, and it's called clinically significant, what we want is interventions that are going to bring that down below 60. Okay, that's the ideal. That's so we would be able to bring whatever those symptoms are, be they anxiety, depression, withdrawal, attention problems, um, something called atypicality, which is just kind of odd behavior that disrupts the class. We want to bring those kinds of issues down so that they're no longer obstacles. And you measure that by saying, can we get those rating scales down under that 60, that, that 60 mark? That's how, that's how we look at it, and that's how we want parents to look at it. It's a reduction of the symptoms. So correspondingly, we are going to write a goal about which of those areas in, that are clinically significant we're going to specifically address to bring down. At EDC, uh, we have a lot of goals around reduction of anxiety symptoms. Now, those, an those anxiety symptoms can actually look quite different. They can be, um, they can be everything from uh, tossing objects to elopement, 
from a campus, or they can be um, withdrawing and, and curling into a fetal position under a table, and we get specific and when we describe that, but the goal, the IEP goal, that we measure it is to reduce those symptoms so that they are no longer clinically significant. And if we're really doing our job well, and this is why we work really closely with parents at, at EBC, we want to see those symptoms also abate in the home as well. Yeah. On those tests, do you always get a T score or do they just? There should be a, the, well, a lot of times they'll, they'll point them as, as clinically significant, but I can go and get the number as well. But if it's clinic, clinically significant, if it's called clinically significant, it's a, it's a T-score over 60, okay? So if you see that term, clinically significant, your T-score is higher than a 60. There's also, and I don't want to get too much into the detail, but between 50 and 60 is something called at risk, um, and, and you'll see that too. But it basically, we're, we're concentrating on the clinically significant because they really become then impediments to the learn, uh, youngster's opportunity for learning. Okay, um, notice that what we're also um, trying to do is help the kids also manage their symptoms too. Um, we, we actually really want kids, as they go through the IEP process, to become more and more of self-advocates um, for asking for what they need and then also managing their social and emotional state, states. So, for example, um, we want kids to be able to go into their IEP meeting when, they're, when they leave us as ninth and 10th graders and say, these are the accommodations I need. Now, when I say it as an administrator to administrator, it's easy for the other administrator to go, I don't know if I really can do that. Where if a youngster looks right at the special ed director and goes, I need these things in order to reach my goals, it's very much more difficult for a special educator to say, ah, we're not gonna do that for you, right? And this is why we're actually teaching a lot of self-advocacy and self-determination goals too. Kids have to be able to make choices and they have to be able to advocate for themselves because they're always gonna need some of these accommodations in order to be successful. So just so you know, and this is kind of more detailed stuff. So uh, this, is, uh, this is alphabet soup, sorry about that, but I can explain everything. So if you have a kid with, uh, if you have a child with specific learning disabilities, emotional disturbance, um, other health impaired, I'll explain that in a minute, visual impairment, hearing impairment, um, high functioning autism, Okay, these are eligibilities. These are considered what they, in, in the public sector, as mild to moderate disabilities, and therefore a school, including ours, all the way, we are required to have materials and instructional protocols that access kids to grade level curriculum. We're required to. So, if your youngster is that, in mild to moderate, the teacher is going to talk to you about how are we going to access youngsters to common core grade level curriculum. Again, I come back, the way they're gonna do it is by the accommodations, okay, and some specific interventions that may happen. But the accommodations are gonna be really key um, in, in this whole process for you. How will the instruction and or performance expectations be adjusted so my child can successfully access the curriculum? That's the question you're gonna ask. How are you going to help my youngster access the curriculum and you want to have something in your back pocket so if they can't answer it, you can? By these accommodations, by these interventions, by the adding this service so that they can do that. And you know what? That question aligns you with the district, believe it or not. You're not looking for something completely different, and the district doesn't want your kid to have something completely different. This isn't a question of if, this is a question of how, and who, and when, and where, okay? That's what you, that's what you really want to get out of, of, out of your IEP. When is my youngster going to receive the services they need? Who's going to deliver it? And how is that going to help them access the general curriculum so they can partake in the rest of the district class environment? So it's, one of the terms that you can come up with in, a, in an IEP meeting is something called universal design for learning. So, very quickly, universal design for learning is um, the newest, most contemporary uh, approach that general education teachers are learning in the, in the universities in teaching heterogeneous kids, a group of heterogeneous classes. 
what it allows them to do is to adjust their, their instructional modalities. It allows them to adjust their response mechanisms from kids, and it allows them to deal with youngsters' engagement in different ways. So no longer in general education is it okay for the teacher to stand behind a podium and lecture to everybody and hand out a piece of paper and say, everybody needs to do this detail. Everybody needs to write this paragraph down for me. Teachers are absolutely being trained in alternative forms of instruction, in alternative forms of the way kids can express what they've learned, and alternative ways that they can engage kids in classes. Okay? So it could be that your problem, that the problem you hit is somebody who doesn't understand universal, universal design for learning, and a teacher who does is actually going to give your youngster a better opportunity to learn in a less restrictive environment. Now, you've got to remember that there are an awful lot of teachers who are tenured who are like me and aging out, and they've done it one way their entire life, okay? And they don't know this. They don't understand this, and they've probably been, some of them, resistant to training. The younger teachers are mandated to understand and master this approach of teaching in order to include more kids and, and develop inclusive classrooms so that there are less kids falling out on, on the side. So a perfectly reasonable question for you to ask is, is my, te is my gen ed teacher trained um, and knowledgeable about universal design? Because if they are, they should be giving you, they, they should be able to come up with more than one way to instruct and more than one way to get a response from your youngster. And they have a perfect opportunity to do it because that's what this allows them to do. Has this been part of the PE curriculum? Um, five, six years now. It's, it's not totally brand new, but the teachers who are actually doing it are now coming on to line. All right, everybody understand that? Because that, that's another key term for you to know. Because maybe, especially if you, I, I know many parents have had this experience. Had a great year first, first. My first grade teacher was wonderful. Second grade teacher, he had a terrible year. The third grade, he did way better. And the fourth grade, has fall, he's fallen apart. Okay, so when that happens, those first and third graders, they, didn't, they may not have known that they were doing UDL, but they did something to make that kid feel competent and competent and, uh, and confident in their classroom. Mm -hmm. And that's why they engage them. And teachers have the power to do that, folks. I, I gotta tell you, they have, the, they have the power to make your kids feel confident or not. And confident or not. And the people who know this are more likely to be able to instill competency and confidence in, with your kids than the ones who don't. Yes? If you have a teacher who's really open and flexible and understands your students, struggles, but it's the administration. So the administration shouldn't actually be interfering with that teacher. Well, but they're not giving her the support that she needs. So the, yeah. the teacher is frustrated. Is exactly the parents and the teacher are frustrated yeah. while we wait for them to do all of yeah. their stuff. I, I wish I had an easy answer for that. That's uh, most of the time what happens is you either see the not so good side of me <laughs> or there's an advocate in the room during an IEP process and they're actually trying to push the administration back out and allowing this kind of thing to happen. Okay, great question, and unfortunately it's true. Although, I, I, let me, the good news I have is we actually, at Esther B. Clark, I, I'm known as the IEP king. I've probably done like a thousand IEPs, over a thousand. Um, we have contracts right now with over 53 districts, and we are, I'm finding better and better receptivity to what we're trying to do. And, and the accommodations and the goal setting and all of that is becoming better known by today's program specialists. But I'm going to put a caveat on that. They know that I know, right? And they may, and, and they may not know that you know. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that in just a second, too. All right, IEPs. So it's definitely necessary. It should, both parents, it's really important. Uh, you know, no matter how much the, the partner is involved on a day-to-day -day basis, the, uh, your pre the, the dual presence of, some, of people at an IEP is really important. Um, I, whoops, sorry about that. 
you have every right to request any testing report before you walk into an IEP. In fact, you need to demand that. It is absolutely unfair for you to try to absorb a testing report and have somebody who's already developed all the goals and you're supposed to sign the document at the end of the, at the, end of the meeting. Absolutely not fair. Okay, that's a power play and you, you can't accept that. So what you need to do when you have a triennial, uh, that's what it's called when you have a testing and your youngsters in special ed, is you make it very clear that you want that report 48 hours or 72 hours before you're going to go into that meeting. Absolutely. It, I, I, we are, we, I've canceled meetings because they're so complex and so much is being demanded of the parents' consent during those periods of time that it's, they're overwhelmed and understandably so. You have every right to sign that you've attended the IEP and not sign that you consent to the IEP. Now, I'm going to give you a caution on this. I have had parents take away their IEPs and not sign them. That doesn't know, that, I'm going to tell you, legally that does you no good. You know why? Because unless we get some signature, the new IEP with the goals or the accommodations or the services that you may want will not, are not legally bound to be instilled. The old IEP is what you work off of, which may not be relevant for your youngster anymore. So take it out. Make a promise to yourself that within three days, you're going to figure out how to sign it. Now, it's perfectly reasonable to sign with exception. And there is a place on the signature page for signing with exception. So if you have a part of an IEP that you are uncomfortable with, sign the exception. Because everything else then can be Im implemented at that point in time. But nothing can be implemented if that IEP disappears from that IEP room without your, without your signature. Okay, so what I'm saying is, don't feel pressured to do it in the moment, but by putting it aside and say, I'm not signing this IEP because I don't like it, is not a service for you. It's not helping your youngster. Questions about that? Yes? Um, once they sign the IEP, um, does it mean that um, we cannot ask more services? Ah, okay. So here's the, Here's the component that districts don't want you to know, but it's easy to read, so it's not a secret. Once you implement the IEP, you can call an IEP a week later if you want. You can call another IEP. In fact, if you sign with exception, you want to make sure another meeting is set up. Okay? So, because you're obviously disagreeing with something, so when you sign for exception, you want to say, when is the, let's set the date for this follow up so we can resolve this particular issue. Okay? Everybody got that? That's a good question. Great. When you sign with the exception, do you have to uh, state what the exception yes. is at yeah. that time? Yeah. Okay. yeah. That's why you take it home and you think about it. So for those of you who are new in, in IEP development um, and you are uncomfortable with one, with, with the IEP that's been offered, you uh, probably uh, would be well to look at an advocate or an educational consultant or somebody who is knowledgeable about the IEP process. It may be uh, another parent who's been through it. Um, but having an objective third party take a look at, especially if you have exceptions, is really a, a, a good idea, okay? Um, there are lots of advocates. In fact, if you, how many people are here in Santa Clara County? Okay, you have a tremendous, tr and I, I want you to pick up this. You have a tremendous resource down here at Parents Helping Parents, and they will give you individual consultation on IEPs, okay? And it's absolutely no charge. So you can come up and get a book, book marker at the end. Very impressive organization. We can also help here. I can do 30-minute free consultations, but I, I can't go to the IEP with you. There are also great advocates around here as well um, in, the, in this area. We're lucky to have people who are so knowledgeable. Yep. Yeah. So I, I went to an IEP meeting and I didn't agree with what they said. And they said, let's hold off and have another one like 30 days later. And they basically said my son didn't qualify and they wanted me to do a 504 plan. Okay. And I didn't know any better, right. so I signed it. Okay. But he definitely- You can call again. You can call and say, we need to meet again. I'm not comfortable with that. Right, but since then he's been hospitalized oh, and it's, okay. it's gotten, but can I do it now that he's not in school? If he's been hospitalized, you'll get an IEP. 
when it comes out. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Now, we've, we've seen lots of, unfortunately, we have seen a spike in the number of mainstream kids who have acute onsets of um, anxiety, depression, or something that hospitalizes them, and the district is very quick to make sure they get eligible and get the help they need. Okay. But they said I had to start the whole process over again, do the testing again, do everything again. Mm, boy, I would check with an advocate on that because that's not true. I mean, you, they, sh they can expedite that process. Okay, I mean, it, if a youngster's been hospitalized for severe emotional dysregulation, they basically already qualify for ED or OHI. So that, that's something you shouldn't be a, a major uh, obstacle. And you wanna make sure they get mental health services in, 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 the, in the school at least, okay? Other questions? Yes, ma'am, in the back. So I may have missed this, but in order to demonstrate that the goal has been achieved, there has to be some kind of statistical change. Do you have a, how do you put a time frame around that? Because I was, my understanding was that if they don't achieve that, they can keep going that goal forward, forward, forward. And you're like, okay. So this has to do with goals, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to use a acronym, which is a little trivial, but it, it actually is something that teachers are supposed to um, they're supposed to st stick with. So they're called SMART goals. So SMART goals mean that a youngster is, um, is, has got goals in there that are challenging but attainable. They are time, they're gonna be time measured, they're going to be monitored statistically, and it's something that is going to impact their ability to be able to be successful in the, in the mainstream curriculum. So we have kids who make progress, but they don't meet their goal. So for example, I, 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 just to talk about generally, so in academia, typically you'll see an 80% accuracy or completion rate as being master, uh, a mastering of that level. In behavior, you should see nothing else beside 90 to 95%, okay? Particularly if they're extreme behaviors, every goal should be set for that. So we have kids who make progress from their baseline, which is why I talked about that at first, First of all, so let's say the youngster was able to self-regulate 50% of the time. So one out of every two times they got stressed, they kind of had a meltdown, right? I may not get to 90%, but I should be able to show you that I'm up to 75% or so. So technically speaking, that goal needs to be rewritten, but it is a continuation of that goal until you get to that particular level, okay? But it shouldn't be just a continuation. There should be some tweaking of that goal to indicate that there's been progress made and now we need to address this component of that particular goal, okay? It shouldn't be just rolling over. That's actually illegal. They can't, you, you can't just roll over a goal. You have to at least edit it a little bit so that you indicate that there's been some progress made. And there's a new baseline, right? It should be a new baseline if you've made progress. Good question, and that, I've seen a lot of that too. I, I know people try to get away with that. Oh, let me talk about one more thing before we keep going on the questions. And so you have been a terrific audience, and if you're getting hot and tired and blown out and overwhelmed, just fill out the surveys and you can sneak right out the back, okay? <laughs> um, so, some of you may find a number of different, uh, 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 maybe a large number of areas that you're concerned about. I want you to prioritize the areas that you want the school to particularly target. We sometimes get kids with 12, 15 goals, okay? That, no human being, your kid, yourself, or the teacher are never gonna be able to address that many goals. We just can't do it. It's not possible. So what we ask is that, the, that um, at EBC, for example, we'll say, no more than two academic goals, no more than two behavior goals, and a social emotional goal. Because we engender our kids in working on these goals, okay? And five is about the max that they can work on, and it's about all that teachers, and, and I have a multidisciplinary team, can actually manage in terms of making sure we're making progress. So choose the area that's gonna have the biggest impact and make sure those goals get prioritized. Okay, now when I was kind of flippant and said about periods at the end of sentences, that, that shouldn't be a primary goal. Okay, there are bigger fish to fry than putting dotting I's and crossing T's. I never did it, I, and I'm okay, <laughs> I think. Other questions? Yes? How do you evaluate the school district's like, I guess, recommendation decision about sending your kids to a special ed only class versus a mixed class? 
when the in, in their particular case, like high functioning autism, where uh, mixed kinds of disabilities. Yeah, I actually, <coughs> no, so we haven't toward we actually be toward the mixed class, but toward the class. This is the class of every kid has an IP. Non-categorical. Non-categorical. Yep. And and I don't necessarily going in with with I know what's right, but I, I always want to feel the value. Yeah. All right. So this isn't factually based, but it's my experience is that a teacher, no matter how good they are, in a cross categorizational class is going to be challenged because this is not planful placement of kids in classrooms all the time. They are convenient placements for kids. The specialized needs that high functioning autism autistic kids have are different from the kids from the needs that SLD kids have, which are different from the severely attentional deficit disorder kids. And when they're put into the same environment, it is extremely difficult for even the most experienced special education teacher to make, meet the needs of those particular groups. And I've seen a lot of mixing of those of that group. What they tend to do is then put untrained paraprofessionals in there as well and put, and put them into highly responsible positions and that's that's not acceptable either because the, they're, they're not trained to do that. They're not trained to do the specialized instruction or interventions that each of those mild to moderate groups need. I don't know the answer to it. I wish, I, I actually wish districts would do collaborate, collaborative, collaboratives so that they would switch and, and have kids with more homogeneous needs in these specialized classes so that the teachers can be optimally effective with them. But there's, again, then you're moving kids out of districts and out of their local areas. And so this is a really difficult issue that hasn't been, to my, to my way, completely resolved. We at the non-public school level have the luxury of saying, this is the population we're going to focus on and we're not experts outside of this. And so when districts refer to us, they're referring us kids that fit into a particular profile that we know we can be successful with, and they're not referring us kids that we can't be. But that's not, uh, unfortunately, in the less restrictive settings, that's not a choice that the special education teachers are allowed to make. It's, it's a difficult situation. That's all I can, I'm sorry, that's the best answer I can give you because it is the case. Other ones, did I have, I, Let's see if I have anything else here that I forgot to tell you. Oh yeah, okay, so if you're going into a highly emotional or you think a um, particularly contentious one where you anticipate that you're going to have difficulty, um, it is really a good idea to bring objective, an objective third party. It can be a neighbor, it can be a relative, be an advocate, but um, if you love your kids, right? You're passionate about making sure their needs are met. But these, some, these dis discussions can sometimes get pretty heated and it's hard to hear certain information. It's hard to have a reciprocal dialogue. And so it's really much better when you are emotionally invested in this that somebody is objective and listening and making sure that you, want, that you get the information that was given in that meeting as well as you giving that information, okay, and conveying what you need to do. Okay, um, and then I talked about the top issues. Remember that for a lot of kids, I, IEPs, and, and this is the way the district kind of focuses on, on is, they, is they get something you want to get over. But for a number of kind of kids, for numbers of kids, the IEP is actually the prescription for success. Okay, That's, this is why I talked about accommodations so much. The accommodations are the, are the long-term prescription for success for your kid. When, if they utilize them. And that's something that you actually don't want removed. And it's very easy to keep kids on an IEP, have them mainstreamed, and making sure that that IEP has accommodations so that everybody understands this is how, these are the accommodations this youngster needs to be in your classroom and be successful. All right, that's a, that's a review. That's a review. I know you can do this on your own. You don't want to do it a group exercise. I was going to give you a quiz at the end. <laughs> But you're all awake, so I don't have to do it. I don't have to do that. Any other last minute questions? It's getting, I know it's getting hot and late, and you have been very attentive. Yes, one more question. Can you just go over again the standards that you're talking about? You talked about the difference with the school districts used to use for both. Okay, so they used to use this straight up discrepancy formula. Okay, I'm going to oversimplify this. So this stands for full scale IQ. 
So if you had a number, this year, youngster ended up with all the subtests being basically 100, okay? And under written expression, uh, as an achievement test, they had an 84 standard score. That discrepancy would automatically entitle you for eligibility into special education. Okay, but it's not true anymore. So your youngster may have a score of 89, which doesn't mean the standard deviation, but you can request that he, he become el they, they become eligible. Uh, 129 to 100. Ah, uh, okay. So, so what you're going to ask for in that case are, are the accommodations, okay? The accommodation is received. You won't get services until they get down below average, but accommodations are absolutely entitled. They will. Even if some of the test scores are really low, but yeah. the average yeah. doesn't matter. The average in one subject or in general? In general um, so typically speaking, in order to get here, well, you, so it could be, I mean, we see, and we see scores. We'll see scores like this. Which one is this? Point this is processing speed, speed and working memory. Okay. We'll see that a lot in the profile of kids that we have. So I can't fix these. They need accommodations. Okay. This is where your accommodations come in. It works. So it's easy here. So working memory, a lot of the guys can't remember what's spoken. So they need a visual reference. Instead of putting the pressure on having them remember what was said, what they need is visual reminders. Okay. So they can have the notes with them. For processing speed is simply slowing down the pace of instruction and slowing down the response time required. Okay, so it gives you, here's a, here's a very simple way that can be done. I'm going to come back and ask you a question on question number two on that page, but first I'm going to ask this young lady the answer to question number one. See, I just gave her thinking, I gave her thinking time. That simple. There's an, that's an accommodation that a good teacher understands processing goes here and then back to here and now she says her thinking time to come up with the answer. Now I know it. And most of the kids <laughs> and most of the kids don't even know I've made an accommodation for this young because it's so subtle. But you'd be surprised and I'm trying to teach everybody it's going over the screen. How did you know? <laughs> yes. So the IT if they're saying so there's a discrepancy <coughs> there. and um, but uh, in our academic assessment we don't see any issues. You won't get an IT then. Oh so not just this. I mean, if, if all your, so let me say, if all your academic scores are in are 90 and above, you probably won't qualify for special education. Okay, you won't. You might get, you might get accommodations, but you won't get any, you, you might get an IEP that's gonna try to put you in a 504. The accommodations are gonna be what they try to input. You, that's what you want is the accommodation. Now, if you know your teachers and you're willing to be an advocate and walk in, you can make the 504 plan work. But you, instead of a legally binding, binding document, you become the person who's going to monitor that, whether those accommodations are implemented or not. And frankly, if Mr. Smith says I'm not doing it, then you have to decide if you're going to change the teacher or what are you going to do with that. Yes? I didn't get your 30 minutes this year for anyone. You said you. I'm sorry. Say that again. You said you do free consultation. Oh. Um, actually, the, the organization does free parent consultation. So you just have to call the main line, and they'll do them here. And parent, like, did you pick up a bookmark? Yes. Okay. So they, you have to just call them, and they they will do it. Yes. Uh, right here. I have a two E child who is very yes. visual spatial, and he's dyslexic. Yeah. He's processing. Issue, working memory issue, he didn't qualify for any IEP. Not, not by working memory or processing speed? Well, the school wanted to <coughs> use this to look at the memory side and then we end, uh -huh. ended up showing uh, uh, and the in the charter yeah. school. Um, the charter school did their own um, evaluation yes. and they ended up giving us a 54. <coughs> and even though his emotional behavior, they considered uh, um, so this is about charter schools so make no mistake charter schools are under the same rules and regulations and legality as our public school systems but they were conceived with the idea that a different philosophy of instruction would mitigate 
the problems that they've had in other, in other settings. So charter schools today have very limited resources for special education. I mean, they really actually don't plan on having special education kids at charter schools. So the original um, reaction of charter schools when they found they had these kids who were not fitting in was to try to dump them back into the district um, and let the district do the special education. That is no longer uh, legal. Um, the, the charter school is responsible for educating uh, their kids, including the special needs that they qualify for. Now, they, the, your, your battle is the qualification. Um, you may want, I don't know who did your assessment, but you may want to have that assessor accompany you to a meeting with the charter school and, and see if you can impose some kind of um, some kind of services or some kind of interventions or accommodations on the, on that. Because if you record the meeting also, you know, and then take it to an, uh, an advocate or an educational consultant or a mediator, and it's clear that there were issues and the school decided not to deal with it, then th they're not going to be standing on solid ground. Most charter schools are so resource limited in their special education departments that they don't really want to put kids in special education. Yes. How often you can ask for a review of the IP? I haven't had one yet. Um, it's coming in, in next month. Yep. I'm new to the. Yeah. So IEPs are written on annual basis, but a parent may call an IEP at any time that you have concerns. Yeah, but how do I know this is progress? Like, I, do I, like I just talk to the teacher. Yeah, you talk to the teacher. Yeah, yeah. And the teacher should, the teacher should be knowledgeable about the IEP goals and what they are and be able to show you they should be keeping a portfolio so they can you can see the progress that the youngster is making um, on, on that particular. So I can access to the portfolio. Yeah. 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 Ask them to keep a portfolio so you can periodically check in on that. Great question. Yes. Um, so when the goals of my child is a sixth, seventh grader, so the goals that I've known is we have our annual coming up. And so the goals look about the same as last year's. So what I understand what you just said, so I have to look at the baseline to see that they've actually, whatever percentage they've made, they have to improve at the baseline. Yeah. Because what third, so I kind of share that with the group, and you know, part two will be next week, but part one was last week. So they said, because each grade developmentally is different at each grade level, so the goals um, are written because he's, so I, I don't know if the goals have been yeah. met based okay. on the baseline, and so they said, well, he's in a different grade level now, so they're different. Grade. So I don't understand exactly what okay. that is. They're basing it on developmentally where he's at in seventh grade, but I still don't understand if he's met the goal. Yeah, so this is this is a tricky part of writing goals. So technically speaking, remember I said that kids who had um, the eligibilities of SLD or OHI or those are mild to moderate. So the goals are technically supposed to be written, and I haven't been able to reconcile this. So there is a, there's a, a viewpoint that the goals are supposed to be written for kids to access that grade level curriculum, okay? So you may see, and this, this doesn't make any, this is the part that doesn't make any sense to me. Let's say you start with a baseline of Billy is understanding or is comprehending 60% of the literature text that being presented in sixth grade, okay? So then the goal is Billy will comprehend 80% of the seventh grade text and right now he's at 60 percentile and he, did, he doesn't make 80. So then they're gonna write it for the next age group. It doesn't make any sense, but if you go back into the curriculum, and I, I don't wanna get too mired in, in mental making stuff, but the skill development in each of those is gonna be a little bit different. And so what they, so the skill development at the sixth grade level is gonna differ from the seventh grade level. So what you might want to do is ask for the more specific components of the skill development that you're looking for in that grade and then be able to ask questions specifically, what skills is he still lacking in as opposed to the grade level, which is easy to get mired into. But remember that each grade level has specific skills that they're teaching. So g go down into that, into that depth with them, saying what are the primary skills we're looking at here, which ones is he having the most problems with, and then can I, I want to monitor those, okay? That's a really good question. It's hard for, hard to sort out. Yep. So I kind of have a charter school question. So we are planning a few years down the line to kind of to try out for charter. But, and when we talked to the school district, they said that it depends on what the charter would, 
funded or their bylaws or MOUs or something like that. And we found out that they originate on the county level and not on the school district level, not on the state okay. level. But then, so he kind of cringed and said that the services would be a little bit different. Uh, what does that mean? Yeah, so, so technically, I'm not sure but I understand the nuance here, but as I understand it, technically charter schools select by absolutely random lottery. They are not allowed actually to ask the, the history, the amount of services, what the, you know, what problem, behavior problems they've had before, that it is, a, it is supposed to be a blind random lottery. Otherwise, they're violating the premise of a charter school and they're, you become almost like a private school where private schools are allowed to say, I'm sorry, your youngster doesn't fit the profile of our, of our particular school. But charter schools do not have that selection to do. See, they, 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 when they knew they couldn't, and yet they got kids who didn't fit their particular educational philosophy, they tried to dump those kids back into the public district. The public district said, no, you're, you're a public entity, and you're open access to all kids, regardless of what, who they are. But then the charter school does need to provide you with a specialized service that your youngster needs in order to be successful in school. Uh, the, not the county special uh, county office of education special services shouldn't be. It may be a county program, but it shouldn't be. If it's run by a special education, that it's not actually a charter school. So it's going to be a county program for specialized kids. That's what they're saying is that the charter school that they're looking at is charters through the county. Yeah. Right, that shouldn't make any difference. It doesn't matter whether it's a district or a county. I mean, if it's a charter school, it is open access. So, for example, a, a, San, Jose, a, a San Jose charter school may only be open to San Jose residents. A county charter school would be open up to Santa Clara County. That should be the only difference, okay? You don't ask whether they have resources or not, because if they say no, then what, right? What services are you going to be able to provide? How are you going to enable my youngster to access the curriculum? Okay, you don't ask if. You must ask how, who, where, when, through what service, through what accommodations. Okay, don't ask if they have the resources. That gives them an out. Okay, because then they can say, I don't have them. Okay, and then what? You're gonna have to either take your youngster out and start all over again, or uh, that's not the question you want to ask. Okay. Two more questions. Yes. Uh, how do you know if your teacher is pushing your child enough? If she's, you know, some I, we got a mid-year report card, and so many of the uh, criteria that uh, they're assessed on are in progress. And I just feel like she's just drumming it down so that at the end of the year she can say, "Oh, we made so much progress." So, that's a really good question. So this is a little difference between, uh, there's a significant difference between stress, health, healthy stress and debilitating anxiety, okay? Nobody wants their kid to come home with debilitating anxiety, right? But you also don't want kids to come home and be bored and sort of lethargic about school, okay? There should be some sense of challenge that they feel that you can sort of sense as a mom, you know, they're like, like they're learning. <laughs> They're, they're somehow talking about new things they're learning, okay? If you never hear about new things they're learning um, or, or newness or they never talk about school in, in, in sort of a challenging way, then they're probably not being challenged, okay? On the other hand, if they're coming home and they are complaining of headaches and stomach aches and all that somaticizing, that's no good either, okay? So there's a fine line in be where your youngster is feeling like they've got to really work but they're accomplishing new things and the idea of becoming debilitated because they're overly stressed and that's counterproductive completely. It's a sense, it's more of an intuition than it's gonna be a sort of document. Last question. Uh, what type of social emotional services we can ask for and do they have to be uh, within the school hours or can we extend it to um, after school hours? This is mental health services, is that what you're asking? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> all right, well, the best example I can give you is what we do at EBC. So uh, the kids come at 8 o'clock and they're there till 2.30. We have therapy appointments at 7.30 and we have them till 3.30. So 
typically speaking, you know, and, and, and if you're dealing with um, school personnel, you're probably dealing with unions a little bit, and you're going to be dealing with some kind of hour restrictions that the that the union actually has the right to say, we can provide services within this time frame, but not necessarily. We won't be compelled to do it at 6 o'clock at night. Okay, everybody, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. <laughs>